the investigation. New focus on debris that flew off the fuel tank right after launch. Also, what was the point of no return for the Columbia crew? Early warnings, the private NASA memo about possible problems, and why NASA forced out its own advisors who warned about safety. In depth, manned missions. Why launch people into space when most science experiments can be done without them? And target Iraq. Secretary of State Powell now concedes there will be no smoking gun in Wednesday's speech to the UN, but says the case is strong against Saddam. From NBC News, World Headquarters in New York, this is NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Good evening. It appears tonight, based on the early theories of what happened to the shuttle Columbia, that the flight may have been doomed from the start, from shortly after takeoff, when a piece of insulation from the external fuel tank tore away and banged into the left wing. It apparently damaged some of the heat tiles, which are there to protect the shuttle against the very high temperatures generated during re-entry. That's the leading theory tonight, and if it holds up, the chances of fixing it during the flight were very remote. The investigation is the immediate focus now, but the long-range future of the shuttle also is in play, and tomorrow, the president will attend a memorial to the lost astronauts. We're going to begin tonight with NBC's Robert Hager at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Robert? Tom, here's how that theory works, that the insulation ripped off the top of the external fuel tank at liftoff and hit the back side of the left wing back here, may have knocked off some of the shuttle's protective heat tiles, and in turn, when the shuttle re-entered the atmosphere without this apparatus now, that heat may have penetrated the heat of re-entering the atmosphere through the area of the missing tiles and damaged something in here that caused the shuttle to break up. Today, NASA said it had studied pictures of that liftoff while the shuttle was in orbit, but decided the maximum damage could have been to an area about 7 inches by 30 inches, and that that shouldn't be a safety problem, according to shuttle program manager Tom Dittimore. Even though you might have localized structural damage, you would not have damage sufficient to cause a catastrophic event, nor impact the flying qualities of the vehicle. Here are pictures of that debris ripping off the external tank a minute 20 seconds after launch and hitting the shuttle. In this close-up, this is the external tank. This is the nose and left wing of the shuttle. Watch now, here's the insulation coming off the external tank. Now it disappears behind the wing, which is when it strikes the wing's underside. Then it re-emerges in a cloud of debris that could include some of the tiles it may have knocked off. NASA saw this video a day after the launch and could have asked the military or spy agencies to try to get super close-ups from satellites or high-powered telescopes on the ground to further assess tile damage. But officials say now they just didn't believe it would help and in any event didn't think it was a safety issue. It was NBC's Jay Barbary who this morning first uncovered that NASA engineering report warning of a possible 30 inches of damage. Unfortunately, there are a lot of routine memos like this that are given out daily, but in this case, they should have paid more attention to it because this could have been the cause of Columbia's tragedy. In California, Caltech astronomer Anthony Beasley, watching the shuttle just beginning to descend on Saturday, believed he saw something already starting to stream off the shuttle. I think that uh, with the early flickering and the small pieces that seem to be coming off um, the shuttle, uh, it, uh, perhaps at that point it could have been tiled. Finally, Beasley thought he saw the shuttle begin to break up. Here, by the way, is what a tile looks like. Very fragile and lightweight, so it's easy to damage, but very effective at protecting from searing heat if it's not missing. Tom? NBC's Robert Hager tonight at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Suppose NASA did have a safety problem and knew so almost immediately. Could anything have been done to save the shuttle crew, or had they passed the point of no return? NBC Chief Science Correspondent Robert Bazell has been covering the shuttle program since it started in 1981, and he's here with more on that tonight. Robert, what's the latest? Tom, the question is, what if? What if mission controllers had decided that that piece of foam had caused sufficient damage to the heat-protective tiles to pose a risk to the crew? Booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia. With Minutes after launch, the shuttle can return to the landing strip at the Kennedy Space Center or cross the Atlantic to an Air Force base in Spain. But those contingencies are primarily for engine failure. And NASA officials say they did not start thinking about possible tile damage until the next day. From the inception of the shuttle program, 
Experts recognize that loss of tiles could destroy the spaceship because of extreme heat during re-entry. For several years, astronauts trained with tile repair kits. But Columbia was not carrying the robot arm or jet backpacks that would have allowed astronauts to get in position for repairs, and many doubt it could work. A flailing astronaut underneath the space shuttle would probably do more damage than good. Rescuing the astronauts? Columbia was not in an orbit that would have allowed it to hook up with the International Space Station. But NASA could have tried to rush up another shuttle. The next mission was planned for about a month from now and Columbia had enough supplies for another two weeks or so in space. Engineers say astronauts from the rescue mission could have carried spacesuits to allow the Columbia astronauts to get out. That's a science fiction scenario, but it's the kind of thing that the people at NASA have done in the past before they make science fiction movies about them. A last option? Columbia could have flown in at an angle to put most of the heat on the undamaged right wing, a plan NASA said today would be difficult and highly dangerous. But the bottom line is NASA did not consider the problem serious because insulation had struck the shuttle before. An accident can happen several times and not cause a disaster. Remember, shuttle O-rings had failed nine times before that problem destroyed the Challenger. Tom? Thanks very much, NBC's Robert Bissell tonight. Soon after the full extent of the Columbia disaster was realized, we began to hear that there had been warnings that the shuttle program was pushing the safety limits. And those sounding the warnings soon found themselves on the outside looking in. Why? NBC's senior investigative correspondent, Lisa Myers, now. When an expert NASA advisory panel warned almost two years ago that budget cuts threatened to erode shuttle safety, more than half of its members were forced out, and another quit in protest. What was unusual, we weren't given very much notice. It was done abruptly. It had never been done abruptly before. Dr. Norris Crone says members were upset about being removed in the middle of their terms. Today, NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe denied members were removed to silence them, claiming NASA changed the length of terms. Well, it was, again, based on this proposition that we really want to infuse fresh new talent to the thought uh, and the consideration of all the things that go on in safety. But a NASA consultant involved with the advisory board, also dismissed at the time, says it felt like a case of shooting the messenger. We had been pushing hard on, on a number of uh, uh, key issues re regarding upgrading of the, of the space shuttle, and that might have played a part in it. The advisory report being prepared at the time warned that current and proposed budgets are not sufficient to improve or even maintain the safety risk level of operating the space shuttle. A year after the dismissals, the then head of the advisory panel, Dr. Richard Blomberg, told Congress he'd never been more concerned about eroded budgets and the margin of safety. You just never know when you cross that line. And GAO investigators have warned twice that workforce cutbacks threaten safety. Even the head of the group that maintains and refurbishes the shuttle told Congress, I am more pessimistic today than I have been in the 17 years that I have been doing this because the ice is getting thinner under our feet. Still, in all these warnings from inside and outside the space program, no one warned of any problems with this flight or of any immediate dangers to the astronauts. In fact, the advisory panel explicitly said last year it believed safety had not yet been compromised. Lisa Myers, NBC News, Washington. More and more pieces of the space shuttle are being found across a wide patch of Texas. The debris field is much larger than first thought, covering some 28,000 square miles. A short time ago, they discovered the shuttle's nose cone just outside of Hemp Hill, Texas, in Sabine County, which is in East Texas. NBC's national correspondent Jim Avila now in one of the East Texas towns where this search is underway. Texas state police boats back on the Toledo Bend Reservoir today, bringing divers and metal detectors, dragging underwater cameras to search for what a fisherman described as a shuttle piece the size of a small car. Still no luck, even with precise GPS coordinates. If you've ever dropped a penny or a nickel into a, to a bowl of water and watch what it did once it hit the water, that's where we're having, having our problems. Nothing underwater recovered to date, but on land, more than 2,000 pieces of shuttle wreckage, including this huge ball, thought to be a fuel tank, found and marked in the East Texas woods, where the largest concentration of debris fell. A slow, difficult search in what's called the Texas Thicket, 
hard to see, hard to move. It took more than 200 volunteers, more than eight hours, to comb through just four miles here. I will go. Volunteer search teams noting location of all the large pieces, touching nothing. Some pieces, like this shuttle bolt, could be explosive. The cabin itself was constructed with bolts that were designed to explode in certain situations to free the cabin from the other debris. This material all collected from local schools. It, along with everything else found here, will eventually be used to reconstruct the shuttle on chicken wire, a jigsaw puzzle technique used investigating the crash of Pan Am 103, among others, and yielding critical clues. The big pieces came through relatively unscathed, and then there's been a couple small pieces, like the patch, uh, which is amazing. An effort experts say may take another six months, but starting one careful step at a time in the East Texas woods. Jim Avila, NBC News, Hemp Hill.